as we move from little blue links to AI summaries, does this threaten the business model of the internet? Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief Headlines Edition, all the daily AI news you need in around five minutes. There's no doubt that AI is changing the way that we interact with the internet. And one of the clearest examples of this is our habits around search. For a couple of decades, the starting point experience for the internet was to go to Google, ask a question, search for something you were looking for, and get a whole bunch of links that you have to progressively go through to find the right answers. Now, that supported the business model of the internet because that process drove clicks to all these different sites. Search economics were at the core of how the internet functioned. And all of that is, of course, changing. A great example of this came in recent testimony in the Google antitrust case, where it was revealed that Apple is, quote, actively looking at revamping Safari to focus on AI-powered search engines. Senior VP of Services Eddie Q said that he believes that AI search providers like OpenAI, Perplexity, and Anthropic will eventually replace traditional Google search. He intends to bring all of those options to Safari in the future, stating, we will add them to the list, they probably won't be the default. Q mentioned that Apple has already had some discussions with Perplexity about adding them to the platform. The discussion comes as part of the remedies portion of the Google trial, which is nominally about how to force the company to relinquish their monopoly on search. However, testimony has progressively turned to new monopoly issues regarding AI. Q mentioned that the search segment is more wide open than it's ever been, stating, Prior to AI, my feeling around this was none of the others were valid choices. I think today there is a much greater potential because there are new entrants attacking the problem in a different way. He feels that the switch to AI search is inevitable, adding, There's enough money now, enough large players, that I don't see how it doesn't happen. Now, Q also did mention that AI search isn't quite good enough in its current form, but he doesn't expect that to last long. Indeed, he says that they expect to have AI search options in Safari by the end of the year. It was also noted that search volume on Safari declined for the first time ever last month, a shift that Q attributes to the increased use of AI. And this shift also highlights the changing monetization of the internet. Q, for his part, said he's losing sleep over the possibility of losing their revenue-sharing agreement with Google on search. And Cloudflare CEO Matthew Prince recently spoke at the Council on Foreign Relations to talk about exactly this. AI is going to fundamentally change the business model of the web. The business model of the web for the last 15 years has been search. One way or another, search drives everything that happens online. Prince went on to explain that in the early days, for every two page of data that Google scraped, websites would receive on average one visitor. That rate is now down to one visitor per six pages of data. Prince commented that the thing that's changed is that, quote, 75% of the queries that get put into Google get answered without you leaving Google. They get answered on that page. 10 years ago, you might get sent to a Wikipedia page. Today, the answer comes right up on the page. The consequence of that is that content creators, if they were deriving value through subscriptions or putting up ads, or even just the ego that someone is reading your stuff, that's gone. Prince concluded, the business model of the web can't survive unless there's some change. Now, the market took all of this very harshly. Google shares were way down following this testimony. And CNBC's Deirdre Bosa said that even though Google is obviously involved in disrupting itself with this, Apple's comments on Google search confirms investors' worst fear. The AI shift is here, and Google didn't move fast enough. Innovator's dilemma is real. Google shares down greater than 8%. Others are more skeptical. Talon Sharp Edge writes, The market isn't reacting to fundamentals. It's reacting to headlines and vibes. One whiff of Apple might do AI search and Alphabet drops like it got margin called by Skynet. Meanwhile, Apple hasn't shipped a decent piece of software innovation since Steve Jobs' hoodie era. Siri still thinks Call Mom means opening your calendar. Their actual AI moves are mostly rebranding and wrapping third-party models likely Google or OpenAI. And yet Wall Street thinks this is the death knell for Google search? Bloomberg's Mark Gurman had a different take that I think is pretty interesting. He basically said that this is Apple trying to save its search deal by selling the court on the idea that Google is outdated and the iPhone is dying. As he puts it, in other words, the deal doesn't matter anyways, so no one needs to break it up. I think there definitely could be some truth to this. And David Barnard continued, That's the thing about regulation. By the time regulators take action, the market has often already started shifting by natural forces. Next up, a follow-on to story from earlier this week. More details are emerging as OpenAI tries to restructure their deal with Microsoft. As you'll well know, OpenAI recently announced that they were changing their plans around a conversion to a for-profit company, but one of the sticking points had been Microsoft, who are owed a revenue share based on their early-stage investment. Some suggest that the deal could be worth over $130 billion. Bloomberg reported on Monday that Microsoft was the key holdout among investors as OpenAI attempted to complete their new restructuring plan. New reporting from the information gave some insights into the state of the negotiations. 
Citing financial documents, they report that OpenAI has told investors that they expect the revenue share to be cut in half by the end of the decade. Reportedly, the existing terms were that OpenAI would share 20% of its top-line revenue with Microsoft, alongside a 49% share of profits capped at $92 billion. The company said that they expect the revenue share to drop to 10% by 2030. This might not end up being that much of a discount. After negotiations around the AGI clause earlier this year, Microsoft reported that their contract will run until 2030, rather than until OpenAI achieves AGI. The quid pro quo is that Microsoft wants to extend their access to OpenAI's technology past 2030, according to documents cited by the information. Now, Microsoft hasn't signed off on anything at this stage, so it could just represent wishful thinking on OpenAI's part. The report states that some OpenAI leaders want Microsoft to exempt future profits from the existing revenue sharing agreement. This is also one of the first times we've seen the figures laid out clearly. If OpenAI hits their 2030 revenue projections, Microsoft would cash in $97 billion just on the revenue share. Austin Allred wrote, 20% of top-line revenue until 2030 is crazy, something you'd see on Shark Tank. Lawyer and former FTC litigator Megan Gray thinks the entire thing is unrealistic, posting, This is one of the funniest things I've seen in a while. OpenAI thinks that A, it has leverage, and B, Microsoft is willing to take on significantly more antitrust risk by converting RevShare to equity deal. Dream on, Sammy. Now, another Microsoft collaboration story, although not with OpenAI this time, Microsoft has signaled that they'll adopt Google's agentic standard. Last month, Google unveiled Agent to Agent, an interoperability protocol that allows agents to communicate with each other. Microsoft has now announced that they'll support A2A on their platforms Azure AI Foundry and Copilot Studio. They've also joined the consortium of companies working to develop the protocol. In a blog post, Microsoft reinforced how important these types of standards are, writing, By supporting A2A and building on our open orchestration platform, we're laying the foundation for the next generation of software, collaborative, observable, and adaptive by design. The best agents won't live in one app or cloud. They'll operate in the flow of work, spanning models, domains, and ecosystems. We're building that future with openness at the center, because agents shouldn't be islands and intelligence should work across boundaries, just like the world it serves. Now, we've previously covered the importance of AI companies aligning on a single or small handful of standards in regards to Anthropic's MCP, which now enjoys support from OpenAI, Google, Microsoft, and many others. Rather than fight out a bitter format war, AI companies seem to have decided to just agree on standards and move on. This means that models should be pretty interchangeable with little vendor lock-in in in this part of the infrastructure stack. A2A does not have the same level of buy-in as MCP at this stage, but Microsoft adopting the standard certainly helps. Now, in launching A2A, Google mentioned that the standard is meant as a complement to MCP rather than a competitor, with each doing slightly different things. MCP is about accessing data from external tooling, while A2A is about allowing agents to share data between themselves. Explaining how A2A will power advanced agent building, Microsoft wrote, Customers can build complex, multi-agent workflows that span internal agents, partner tools, and production infrastructure, while maintaining governance and service level agreements. We're aligning with the broader industry push for shared agent protocols. Lastly today, Mark Zuckerberg wants to build a fully automated AI ad platform. Speaking at Stripe's annual sessions conference on Tuesday, Zuck laid out his plans to create an end-to-end AI tool to upend the advertising industry. He said, The basic end goal here is any business can come to us, say what their objective is, tell us how much they're willing to pay to achieve those results, connect their bank account, and then we just deliver as many results as we can. In a way, it's kind of like the ultimate business results machine. I think it'd be one of the most important and valuable AI systems that gets built. Now, the idea is basically to create thousands of AI-generated variations of ads for each customer, cough, Dr. Strange theory, cough, test them on meta-social networks, and lean into the ones that get results. Zuckerberg first laid out this idea on a podcast appearance last week, proposing a system that's completely full-service, so advertisers wouldn't need to have the input on creative or even choose a demographic to target. Not everyone's a fan of this. In a recent op-ed, John Hornby, the founder of ad agency The Ant Partnership, argued that Zuckerberg doesn't understand how to build brands. He wrote, Give AI another decade and it still won't come up with the truly big ideas that brands have been built on over the past 30 years. Generative AI doesn't do leaps of imagination. It's trained on vast data sets, finding the patterns and relationships that allow it to create ostensibly new content, but these are just riffs on what's gone before. Artificial intelligence needs human intelligence to make it sing. Now, on the one hand, John's not wrong here, but on the other hand, boy are these two talking about fundamentally different things. Zuckerberg isn't trying to cut humans out of the Super Bowl ad process. He's not arguing that they can build brand better than an agency can. Zuckerberg is focused on making the treadmill of social media advertising, in other words, direct response advertising, not brand advertising, direct response advertising, as cheap and efficient as possible. While TechCrunch calls this a social media nightmare, 
This is pretty much just an indication of TechCrunch's barely contained loathing of the industry they cover now. And also, it doesn't really matter because this is completely inevitable. Social media advertising is already essentially a number-crunching exercise to figure out what works. Adding AI-generated ads and automating the testing seems like the obvious next step. Look, man, I've made Super Bowl ads. This is the part of the ad process that the only people who truly love are the calculator brains who figured out how to game this system. The ad folks who love their creative and go to can and do all that stuff have nothing to worry about here. But for the vast majority of small businesses and people who are just trying to sell stuff on the internet, this is just likely to work a lot better. Anyways, friends, that obviously could be a whole episode, but that is going to do it for this very extended edition of the headlines. I had pre-recorded the main episode and saw that it was a little shorter than normal today, so I decided it was okay to go a little long. But in any case, with that, let's move over to that main part of the episode. <laughs> 